Hello and welcome to another episode of the Llama Commerce Show. I'm Kurt Theobald, CEO at Classy Llama. And I'm Brett Curry, lead strategist at Classy Llama. And today we have a very special show. It's almost like it's the one year anniversary of the Llama Commerce Show, but it's not because we haven't been doing this for a year. It's been more like, I don't know, nine months, 24 days or something like that. But we're going to pretend that this is some sort of anniversary thing. This is a, this is a milestone. This is a landmark event. Mm -hmm. I think our mm -hmm. kid will one day be reading about this event Agreed. in the e-commerce textbooks. And the reason for that is because Jesse Tyler, our producer, has, has uh, uh, exiled from teenagehood. He's now 20. He's As of today, a, a Jesse, man. would you like to come on and, and just show your face for the only time we'll ever let you do that? Again, for podcasters, you're not going to get to enjoy this. But, That's true. But, but and, Jesse, who almost gets fired every episode, we may want to lay off on that. No, don't do that. Don't do that. I, I was that close to firing you just now. See, it just <laughs> happened because he gave a peace yeah. sign on the show. So please leave now. Thank you, Mike. That, that's goodness. just our producer. But the, the that's real why he's never going to be on the show again. Exactly. That's done. Okay. Anyway, we got a competition today. It's getting yes. real in this house because we have a very special guest today. And I'm not talking about Ott, the one-armed table tennis trophy player. I'm talking about, uh, which, by the way, we give out to whomever gives the most value on the show, which is, is going to be a real competition today. Because it's going to be this, no, no handouts today, Kurt. The no last time we way. award our guests mm -hmm. to make them feel good, mm -hmm. today it's going to be a brawl. So you might have heard of e-commerce fuel. It is uh, a podcast that... Um, is slightly more popular than ours, and by slightly, <laughs> I probably mean a lot more popular. Than well, it's ours. just because it's just because they've had more time. I think. I, let's probably put it like that. Too, let's yeah. put it like that. Yeah, exactly. it's because they've had more time. But anyway, we have e-commerce fuel on the show. Brett, would you like to introduce our guest? Absolutely. So uh, Andrew Udarian, he's a trailblazer in the e-commerce podcast space. Also, uh, just a, a fantastic e-commerce strategist. Mm -hmm. I met him through a mutual friend, Ezra Firestone, who's been a guest on the show many times. And Andrew is from the metropolis of Bozeman, Montana. So I think he may be one of the only guests hailing from a smaller market than, than we are. It's pretty He's amazing. from Missouri, so that yeah. is amazing. I did ask Andrew if he was the, the smartest e-commerce marketer in Bozeman, and he felt like he could pretty safely say that. But Andrew's a brilliant guy. He also owns Right. Yes. Channel, Channel radios. <laughs> Sorry, it's such a hard name. We don't have notes. It's so complex. This is why this is why his is more popular than ours. We can't even remember, we can't the even name remember names. Yeah. Rightchannelradios.com. So not only does he host an awesome show, he actually does this day in and day out. So Andrew and Darren, welcome to the show, my friend. We're so excited to have you. Brett, Kurt, thanks, guys. It's an honor to be here. I've been following your work, like I mentioned, for a while. And uh, like you said, it's going to be a brawl. Just because I respect you guys doesn't mean I'm going to like be easy. Gloves are coming off. This, uh, this should get Bottom line I'm here. looking forward to it. So we're taking the best of the best from our shows, and we're going to mash them up together, and, and we're going to, to see who has actually created the most value over Who has the better of ideas, show. who has better content. That's right. You've been around longer, Andrew, mm -hmm. but does that mean your content is better? I don't even know if it's I don't even know if it's our content's better. It's who can steal better ideas from other people that we bring <laughs> onto yeah. our shows. That's really what this is about, right? That's, that's very that's honest. A really that's good point. I wish you hadn't that's given really away our point. trade secrets. Yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> Andrew, uh, we're going to let you go first and lob the first shell because uh, we're really cool like that. Okay, cool. Well, that's, uh, you guys, yeah, that's a big advantage. So I'm going to have to work extra hard to make up for it. So I'd say takeaway number one, like the, one of the biggest things I've noticed uh, from my guests is that building a brand is, is it's always been important, but like it's absolutely essential today. Uh, and not only that, because you hear about that a lot, but I... I don't think you can do it well unless you're doing something really exceptional and really, you know, uh, yeah, just really interesting. We had uh, probably the episode this kind of uh, kind of goes back to is a guy named uh, Ben Jenkins from One Fast Buffalo. I don't know if you guys have, have come across him. Really interesting guy. And he had a couple of great quotes. You know, every good brand needs an enemy, something to rally around. And a lot of times people, uh, you know, a lot of times people say, hey, let's just bring a branding expert in to make us look sexy and, and, and really interesting, when a lot of times you have to step back and say, are we actually doing something worth talking about? Are we actually doing something that can't, lends itself to a compelling story? Because it's really hard, you know, of course, to put lipstick on a pig. So some of the other points we're going to talk about, I think really, uh, um, I, without giving away too much, really tie into this. It's getting so much harder to get attention, uh, more competition. And so, yeah, branding is absolutely essential. If you're not doing something worthwhile, uh, it's it's... It's really hard to do well. So why has it gotten more important recently? What do you think has shifted in the, 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 the market to make that more important? 
Yeah, I'd say a couple of things. I'd say one, uh, a lot of products are especially online are becoming commoditized. You can get them from anywhere. I think Amazon's done a good job of that for you know products with barcodes. Amazon, in my opinion, is at least in terms of uh, the broad market, is the best intersection of convenience, uh, selection, and trust credibility. Right? I mean, they just are. So if you don't own something that Amazon can't undercut you on, it's going to be hard. Secondly, it's, and this is going to kind of uh, cannibalizing one of my points later down the, the road, but it's getting a lot harder to. Way to go, Kurt. Oh, you took the bait. I totally did. Fell into your trap. Um, I don't think I'm gonna get the uh, the one man uh, one arm statue today. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's getting a lot harder to get attention and acquire customers. You got to get a lot more creative with that way. It's not just about. It's a lot harder to go in and buy just some PPC traffic and, and bring someone to your site. So you've got to have other creative ways to market. And the only you know some of the best ways to do that are to be able to have something you're doing that's interesting that organically can spread. I think that's great. I think the flattening of the market has created more competition and in the face of more competition differentiation is critical and key. And, and so whatever it is around your brand that makes you different, it has to be, I, I love what you're saying there, it has to be authentic. It has to be real. You cannot put lipstick on the pig. It's got to be something that's genuine and really differentiating your brand and making a difference. Yeah, I agree. Because if it's not, if it's it's not different, then why wouldn't someone just buy from Amazon? If you don't have a compelling story, if you're not building a community, if there's not something unique about you, then, then why not buy from the category killer? So yeah, absolutely. It's one thing I think it's interesting. I always try to have like skills I focus on for each year, uh, and I'm not, I'm not perfect at them, but I think for 2015, for me, the skill I'm going to try to focus on is storytelling, because I think we all get caught up so much in like uh, e-commerce and SEO and, 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 and our platforms and all this kind of stuff, and we forget that a lot of times what sells best is a great experience and a good story, and it's completely separate from what we focus on. So I don't know if, if, if you guys ever listen to like the Moth podcast. I'm usually plugged in like 90% oh, wow. to, to oh. business podcasts, but the Moth podcast is an awesome example of like what good storytelling can be. So Interesting. Well, this actually segues perfectly. You teed us up and set us up perfectly for our first point. Ah, meeting. shoot. My problem with your first point is that it's too ephemeral. It's like branding is important. Okay, but we're going to give an example of specifically how you can, you can differentiate by using customer service. So I'm going to reference back to our interview with Goodwill. Um, Goodwill Company. Goodwill Company. Uh, who used customer service to make a huge difference in selling something highly commoditized, uh, wheels and, and tires. And, uh, and so the way that they did that is by uh, following up multiple times with phone calls after they made a sale to make sure that it was, the, um, it was the kind of wheel that they needed, that it fit well on their vehicle. They do a lot of consultation ahead of the mm -hmm. sale as well. And uh, they really drive reviews uh, on Amazon, and that or was it eBay? And it was uh, it was both. It was both. both. So but regardless, they have Amazon. just phenomenal reviews, way better than their competitors. And we looked through their reviews, and over and over and over again, they mentioned, uh, well, they followed up with me, and they made sure that it actually fit my vehicle. And that that phone call was so critical to them that that um, that high touch factor um, that differentiated their brand and helped them to to um, differentiate in a highly commoditized space. And I, that was really impressive to us. So that, that's an example, but using that customer service to di drive the differentiation is uh, a huge opportunity, especially when you're going up against someone like Amazon, uh, which continues to gain so much market share, um, but their customer service it can't be as tailored and specialized yeah, yeah. As, uh, as you can be in a niche. Uh, they, have a they have a tremendously great uh, customer service record, but you're not going to be getting. You're going there with the expectation they're not, they're not going to be an expert in the in the product that you're buying. It's a different experience. Yeah, you're going to be able Absolutely. to return stuff easily if you need to, but you're going to get advice or hand holding or really personalized service. And so, looking at and I'll take just a, a slightly different angle there, but looking at service as a marketing component, I think that's what the Goodwill Company has done and lots of other great companies is utilizing that experience and turning that into a reason for people to become evangelists for the brand, and it really fuels the marketing efforts yeah. that are taking place there as well. Yeah. And so not everybody can do what the Goodwill Company does, and they actually had a really good reason to call every single person that made an order, because that's what they do. They call before they ship it, make sure it's the right, the right wheel for the right car, and uh, they do that because I think he said something like 25% were inaccurate. Yep. If they hadn't checked, they would have shipped the wrong product because yep. the customer mm -hmm. got it wrong. And so there's there's a real business reason there, um, so not everybody can do that, but I think you can make your experience better. So maybe it's just a, a custom video based on what someone buys, a video that walks them through 
kind of an unboxing and a setup of whatever mm -hmm. that product is, mm -hmm. or a video series on here's how you maximize your use of our product, or here's an event you can attend online so you can really maximize your benefits here. Yeah, I think it so, has to it has to extend from an obsessive commitment yeah. to that to, to whatever that is that differentiation is. So, like you're saying, it may not be that particular. We're not going to call but, everybody. We have a lot of merchants that aren't going to call all of right. our clients. Yeah, but be obsessively committed to great customer service, and that will differentiate your brand in a big way. Zappos mm -hmm. being a great another great yep. example of, yep. of that taking. And place. they even cut their marketing budget. And this is the the marketing guy speaking here. But they cut their marketing budget at the beginning to do more. With customer service, and it paid off. It paid off yeah. Time. So, so Andrew, if this were a dance off, you just got served. <laughs> Not quite. I've got one counterpoint there. So you're talking oh, about I'm the wheel, wheel company. You're talking about the wheel company. Were they reselling? Did they have their own line of wheels? Were they manufacturing? Were they completely vertically integrated, or were they just a reseller of other people's products? It's a reseller. Reseller. Okay. reseller. So here's the thing. You mentioned Zappos. I agree with you. Customer service is super important. And actually, it was one of my points as well, which I so happened to serve up first. <laughs> no, okay, you're, trying steal, you're trying to steal our points now. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'll send I'll send viewers the the, the email transcript. My camera transcript. But uh, um, you know you think about that, and I agree, customer service hugely important. But reselling products, reselling other people's products, is always a lower margin business than being in your own. And when you look at Amazon, Amazon is getting into everything. They're getting into automotive. They're getting into everything. And and coming from a retailer, I'm a drop shipper right now, looking to get into my own product business. Coming from a drop shipper who's seeing those margins get squeezed. Customer service is crucial. It's what we built our business on too. But customer service, great customer service, is expensive. It's really, you know, you talked about Zappos. Their margins, I mean, they were operating at like 1, 2, 3% margins when they got bought by Amazon. There's no way that if you're not an in enormous juggernaut that gets a free pass from Wall Street that as an independent merchant you're going to be able to make that happen. So if you want to provide customer service, in the long term, you gotta if you want to provide incredible customer service, you gotta have your own proprietary brand to be able to support the margins to make yeah, that margins. happen. And so, therefore, I would say customer stories is important, but even more important is branding and having your own product, which ties into branding. Okay, all right. I think I think that, that was a pretty good <laughs> okay, one. Up. Now, you want to compound that with your next point to really seal the deal here? Oh, okay. Go to the next one. I'd say the, yeah, the next point that I had. Uh, is and, and and this one might get uh, lambasted as well, but I think mobile. <laughs> this is the year. Like this is, this is great. I love this boxing back and forth. Uh, I think 2014 is 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 really the year that mobile has become a, a viable, legitimate sales channel. You can't ignore, it. and even more so, it's starting to actually drive design. Like we're getting ready to do a, a replatforming and. Mobile, you know, even last year, it was like, yeah, mobile, it's probably going to be a big deal at some point, but it's not a pain point because so many retailers, I don't know about the clients that you guys see, but for us, it was something we put off and put off and off. And this year, like half of our customers are on mobile. Our, our mobile conversion rate is terrible. In fact, we had like three or four months where our, our mobile conversion rate dropped and we couldn't figure out why. And then in retrospect, we went back and realized, oh my goodness, our add to cart button wasn't working. And it had a big impact on our sales. And so um, this is... That. You know, this is the year. <laughs> this is the year that it actually is starting to be a real pain point, not just for huge guys, but for independent merchants as well. And I think that's uh, that's pretty notable. So, have you noted that the, uh, the the responsive technology and the responsive movement is as a reaction to that, or is uh, is a, as a solution to that, or was forward thinking ahead of that? Uh, I think it's I, I think it's a reaction to that. Uh, I think there are some people who who probably did it proactively and looked at it, but I think most people, I think I think humans in general, like, I don't know, I, I you know, uh, Kurt, I was talking to you, I wasn't talking to you, I was, I was, I was spying on you before wow. uh, before we came on here, I noticed, like, you're not a big fan of fiat currencies, right? And so, one of the things, I, I, I similar to you, I'm not here, and I would love, what's that, Brett? I've never driven a fiat, I, I, I have no experience. <laughs> well played. Lame um, joke. Really lame. <laughs> yep. Okay. You know, look at. Uh, I would love to see like all of our financial problems solved as well, like by forward-thinking. You know, people in Congress who are trying to solve. That's not how humans work. The only time humans really solve big problems, for the most part, is when they're faced with a crisis, right? And I think that's going to be the case with with to. currency. I think that's going to be the case with most independent mm -hmm. store owners, myself in point, with a mobile design. So I think it's, I think responsive has been a, uh, uh, as a reaction. I'd love to hear like, you're, from you guys seeing... You're a more than, a, more than a, an opportunity, an exploitation of an opportunity, right? Say that again? I said a cure to, a, a cure to an ailment as opposed to an exploitation of an opportunity. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear what, what your guys' experience has been like with clients. Are clients coming to you saying, hey, this is super important in our redesign, or are you guys having to take the lead on that? Well, I think that 2014 is a little bit late. I think that you are, my, my counter to that would simply be that you're a little behind the times. I think that mobile's been huge since last year, and now actually we're moving into convergence. The converging of offline and online into a single online digitized experience, and that is the next wave and something that we're starting to see gain traction. Um, so Elaborate that on that just a little bit. Well, uh, like when you're walking through a store, you have a mobile device with you, mm -hmm. but now creating an experience where that mobile device is communicating with the environment around you to where, uh, for, first of all, I, I mean, within five years, if we haven't completely done away with uh, a counter that you go up to to buy stuff, then I'm going to be really disappointed with, with the, the innovative spirit of our economy right now because that needs to be done away with. We, we have payments on our mobile devices needs to happen to where you don't have that inconvenience waiting in line, waiting to buy something. Secondly, the personalization of the physical experience. When you go into a store, it knows, your, you knows what size you wear. It knows what your past preferences It'll are. It alerts you to, hey, we have these things in stock Preferably, right you know, you walk into a physical experience, you only, you're only browsing things that are in your size, and you're only, you know, maybe, maybe when you go to the dressing room, uh, you want something different. Maybe there's some sort of a, a deal where it's either human-generated or it's, it's robotic and automatic where it's giving you different options of things that are in your mm -hmm. size, and you can, like, try lots of different things or, or meet your style profile or whatever. I'm just talking about apparel right now. But now, blow that out across you know, all kinds of different physical environments and the brick and mortar experience because brick and mortar is critical, it's here to stay, but but apply the digital technology, apply the online technology to that and you transform it, you transmogrify it to a whole new level and whole new plane. Isn't that a great word? Whoa. Uh, yeah, blown away. So regardless, that is that's what's next. That's what's developing right now and, and there's there's a few people that are really thought leading in that regard and, and we're trying, you know, we're certainly investing yeah. in that as an agency um, to make changes in that regard to, to help that but there's going to be some huge winners in that space over the next little bit so not but to downplay that. Point but well taken though uh, from Andrew because I think a lot of merchants are right there. Uh, Andrew, they finally have enough pain that they're taking action uh, as far as their mobile strategy so. Brett is the diplomat between us. <laughs> <laughs> No, great point. It is a huge trend, and, and, and at this point in time, I, to, I, I think your point about reacting to the pain is critical because yeah, I actually think, I, like up until this year, I think the numbers were, and maybe I'm going to now smite my own face in this argument, but maybe up to this year, I think it was like 1%, 1 to 6% penetration responsive. Well, this year, I think we're going to see that, and I think we already see it escalating to, you know, where the technology is catching up with the pain and the need, and we're going to see that at over 20% by the end of this year. So, it's going to blow up. Uh, it is blowing up. So, eh, okay. Yeah, it's decent. Yeah. It, not, not a bad try. Not a bad try. Do I get, can, I, can I do a quick counterpoint? Oh, yeah. Please. Uh, sure. Okay. So, yeah, I would agree with you. I, I mean, 2014 is by no means the, the year where it's like, oh, hey, there's some opportunity in mobile. Maybe we should pay attention to that. That was my point. I think my point was more that independent merchants, and again, I'm kind of I'm kind of coming to this from, from a... Uh, from the perspective of an independent merchant, someone with you know 10 to 20 tops employees looking down the barrel, I think this is the year when it, it became absolutely necessary to start thinking about it. And if you were going to, I agree with that. Um, on the second front, I don't, front, like, it, with that. I don't yeah. like agreeing with you very much, but I I do. <laughs> Mildly. Um, well, thank you. Um, on the <laughs> second front, I mean, you mentioned kind of the, the the merging of online and offline, and again, that's something. That's something, and something I think you know. If you go to if you go to a Macy's, if you go to a Tiffany's, something like that, these big retailers. Yeah, I'm agree. I'm agree. If in five years, if we have the same kind of thing, uh, and there's not some way for smartphones to be able to integrate with with your your brick and mortar shopping experience, I'm going to be disappointed as well. But when I look at online merchants, guys that I imagine, and again, I know you guys do some work for some some pretty big big companies, but at least people that uh, some of your clients and people also that that I look at as independent merchants. The minority of them have a brick and mortar store, and if they do, they're generating most of their revenue online. And so I see for if you're someone like uh, you know Andy Dunn over at Bonobos, yeah, you need That's to be looking at that. But if, you're somebody, awesome. if you're somebody with a fairly fixed budget trying to bootstrap, uh, you don't have venture capital. You've got one brick and mortar location, which really is maybe your offices. You do some retail there, but it drives most of your e-commerce present presence. I don't see that being a really important avenue for innovation for those independent merchants. Not even feasible. It's not even feasible. Not Economically yeah. feasible. It's just like responsive. It, you could not 
justify the cost of going responsive two years ago if you weren't a big player. Mm -hmm. Well, now the technology catches up so that the, the masses, the long tail of the market, can justify the cost of it because the cost of entry is so much lower. Same kind of thing. We, right now, we're in the trailblazing stage of convergence. Mm -hmm. That has to happen before uh, before the, the, the little guys, for lack of a better word, the long tail of the market can justify the cost because the cost of entry will drop substantially once it normalizes. Yeah, no, I hear you, and, and I see that, but even at the same time, can you give me an example of a good, uh, let's say you go into REI and you're looking for some, some, some you know, really lightweight boxers for, you know, because it's super steamy in Missouri. That's a terrible example, but we'll roll with it. <laughs> How... <laughs> Just to make you embarrassed and hopefully maybe throw you off off your off your game here. How is using a smartphone to shop shop for those you know shop for those in REI? How is that going to make that experience better? Because well, I, I don't see... think about convergence as pivoting from a smartphone. Think about it pivoting from a globally present account, a globally present like knowledge digitized version of you that is in the cloud. That they're aware, for instance, it would help you in the context of when you walk into that. If you just have your smartphone in your pocket, they know you're there. Because you have it in there, it identifies who you are, and because of low, low emission Bluetooth and other and iBeacon and other other technologies that are developing, they're going to know exactly where you are in the store. So it's going to be kind of like uh, it could anyway, if it develops like this, it could be kind of like Minority Report, where as you're walking through, there are personalized messaging for you. So when you go up to the the the, the lightweight boxers because it's so steamy hot, mm -hmm. <laughs> something inappropriate at this point, but <laughs> you, you, it's getting hot in here. Look at that steam. It, it only shows you or, or it points you in the right direction or whatever to where your size lightweight boxes are and maybe it's brand preference. You know, you bought Fruit Alone before. A voice says, hey, you know, you're looking cat. Uh -huh. It's like, well, it looks steamy you need some here. lightweight you boxes. Some... <laughs> you need to cool down, buddy. Um, yeah, something like that Maybe less erotic when it comes to boxers. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. uh, that, that, that I probably didn't answer your question, Andrew. I'm a little bit lost now. No, that's that, that, that's interesting. That helps more because um, I I just feel like there's a lot of people that are trying to like put a square you know a square block into a into a round hole and sometimes say hey we have smartphones we have brick and mortar Absolutely. shopping they must yeah. go together well, and and I just I haven't heard a whole lot of compelling cases where I think that would be really useful when I walk into a store but I can the see trend, the trend is pivoting people pivot from the technology and they get all they get all obsessed with the technology. Technology. And that's why we say you have to be obsessed with like customer service or the real delivery of value. Yes. If you start getting obsessed with something like technology, which is a medium through which value is delivered, is, is an accelerator of value delivery, then then you get taken out. So it's absolutely true. Just you, you think about it from what's possible with this, and then you come back to, to center and you go, now what's our, our core? What do we really need to do? And how can this accelerate the delivery of this value or expand it? And, and, and maybe my example isn't a super great one, but um, I've actually done a lot of thought around this. Like when someone comes into an environment, what all could be done um, to make the experience better? Um, you know, pr pr to a degree to where maybe maybe you don't even, and this isn't a fully fleshed thought, but maybe you don't move through the environment, but the environment moves around you. Maybe things come to you that you want. And that same way as you're in the dressing room, ideas and, and, and styles are coming to you that are all in your size, that are pre-picked for you based on your past and that sort of thing. You know, it's a great example of instead of you having to go out and browse everything, ideas are coming to you and we're seeing that right now online with in the apparel side yeah. of things with like packages of, of uh, I can't remember what like a look like a trunk, look trunk box or, a or something look, like that something like that anyways like yeah. you get accessories you've got the you've got the top you've got the bottom and there's all these things lined up and you want to buy all of them it's 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 creating the style experience for you so you don't have to piece everything together yeah. That's the kind, you know, it's just moving the direction of, I'd like more of that in the brick and mortar context. Awesome. And, and with that mobile convergence taking place, um, that's that's more possible. That's becoming possible in the brick and mortar context. Okay, we've got to move on to our second point. Well, so before we do, before point. Before oh, we do oh, though, I'm really hungry. Commercial break. I'm super hey. hungry all of a sudden. Hey, and you so look kind of steamy. I just, Would what? you like, oh, wait a minute. Wait. Uh, sorry, I was stuck on the box. Trying to use sex <laughs> appeal to sell raisins? That's just weird. Um, that's offensive. <laughs> Uh, so um, I got kind of hungry in the middle of the show, and so I decided that I'm going to eat some juicy raisins. Do you so, want some? Yeah, absolutely. So Kurt and I are really vying for a major corporate sponsor for the Llama Commerce show. We feel like this is gold, and someone could be profiting big time mm, from the show. These are good. Are these good? These really? are. They taste kind of like dried grapes. Mm. Mm. I feel replenished. It's really tasty. Energy. I've got energy right now. So and today's what, show... These are specialized. I mean, these are really special. I mean, mm -hmm. what's commoditized about great right, raisins? Right from California. So this show is brought to you by SunMade? It's not actually... Natural It's not raisins. actually brought to you by SunMade. No made. affiliation at all, actually. We're just eating really tasty 
raisins made by SunMade, and and maybe if a SunMade executive is watching out there, you might you know. What do you think, guys? I, mm-hmm. you know, did you see how good it looked when I ate it? Just saying. Yeah, yeah. I think we got. I think we're onto something here. We're, so we're, we're SunMade raisins. They're tasty and light and delicious and dry. Kurt, you've got a, you've got a couple stuck in your goatee there. You got <laughs> they really look so good. Well, I watched that one. All right, yeah, let's all right, move man, on. Next sponsor. But also, I will mention our show is also brought to you by our brand new website. Well, you're just going to drop the bomb. LamaCommerceShow.com. Check it out. It's amazing. Sign up for episode notifications. Everything we've progress. ever done is on that site. It's amazing. Everything, Everything we've ever done. Everything. If you just can't Whole get history. enough, as you just want to watch more, I go there. More Kurt and Brad. The full yeah. nine months, 24 day history is there. It's all there. Okay, wow. awesome. Next Takeaway point. number two from the Llama Commerce Show. Here's what we believe, Andrew, and we're passionate about this. Mm-hmm. I challenge you to uh, find any find any hole or any flaw in this point. Agreed. Because it's not going to happen. Agreed. Building testing into your DNA. So mm-hmm. rather than just testing occasionally, making an ongoing process, getting in a rhythm, as we like to say, with testing. So testing landing pages, testing the checkout process, testing offers, and using a tool, one tool we really like and recommend is Optimizely. It's not the only tool, but we know the people there. We like But as part there. of that, it made it accessible to made the accessible. Scale of the market. We've been talking about yep. that, how technology gets lower in cost. Optimizely made that accessible. Yeah. So you're no longer dependent on developers to make every change. Mm-hmm. You can now test and iterate with the marketing department yep. and then roll out changes to the the dev team when the time. And you don't understand that, take a look at Optimizely. If you know anything about on the technical technical side, it's all JavaScript based. So you're you're dealing with a JavaScript layer instead of the underlying markup, which uh, which makes it to where like like Brett said, you can do it in your marketing with your marketing team instead of your develop development team. Yeah, so awesome. you can look at a landing page and say, let's move the add to cart button around, let's make it bigger, let's change the color, let's move the headline, let's let's once someone gets into the cart, let's take out the top nav option so that someone doesn't get distracted when they're in the checkout process. Mm-hmm. And just testing things like that. What's also cool about Optimizely, and this sounds now like a pitch for Optimizely, maybe, maybe they, they, should they should sponsor the show. Sponsor they should sponsor the yeah, show for absolutely. sure. We've got to talk about that. <laughs> but uh, they will tell you when you're about to start a test how much traffic you need and how long you need to wait before for the, that. For the statistical significance exactly. to play out and that sort of thing. But but the fundamental point is, whether it's Optimizely or not, sure. is we believe that it's critical to your business. That it's very high up on the priority chain. You know those other things you need to do first if, if the other things are broken or not working or whatever or, or, or out of alignment. It's very high up on the priority list to create a discipline mm-hmm. of, of testing on your site in order to improve the user experience. Of course, always pivoting, pivoting from your core value delivery right. channel, whatever that is. It's typically easier to improve your conversions than it is to grow your traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, in, a, in a significant way. You can always get more traffic, but getting the right traffic that converts, that can be a challenge, and you need to do it. But and all the money you're spending on the, on, the, on your traffic gen is you know is going to be deeply affected by the work that you're doing on the on the user experience side of Absolutely. things. And so and that, and that can make a, or break the, the ROI on a traffic investment. So you could actually be investing through you know paid search, and it's just not quite making the money, and so you stop doing it, yeah. when in fact you could have actually made it work made and made the ROI you if you had focused on UX as well alongside it to, to make that work. So, uh, cool. so it's a critically important. Critically we need important to go problem. rapid fire a little bit. So really? We, we should can, probably oh, do, we I should lob it right back to Andrew. Time. Yeah, I know. Andrew, yeah. one up that. Oh, higher conversions are terrible. I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Off the I, I, I would much rather drive 4x of revenue than, than 4x of conversion. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, that's a good I will say, I will say, oh. I agree. That's a, that's a that's a that's a great point. I think the one thing to be careful of, though, is I think sometimes A/B split testing and 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 you know using optimizely and running all those tests. If you haven't got into it and you're not doing a lot of them before, it can be kind of seen as, oh, this hey, this super easy thing to do, this panacea, just set up a couple Absolutely. of A/B tests and, wow. and and wait a week and implement the right one, which increased your revenue 20 percent. It doesn't work. That I mean. There are big wins to be had, but it takes a while. It takes a while to set up tests that, that are the right tests. It takes usually a lot longer than you think to get data that's uh, statistically uh, conclusive for your things. And a lot of tests that you run, like we just ran a test uh, on our homepage that ended up, we ran it for like you know, two plus months, and it ended up it still doesn't have a statistical significance with a decent amount of data. So I 100% agree, but... Uh, it also is a little more challenging than you would think yeah. at the surface. I think that's a really good. I think that's a really good balancing comment, uh, Andrew, because it, it's that's why we say it has to be a focused commitment and discipline. It's yeah. something you work at, just like anything else. 
It's not easy. It takes time. It takes effort. You're going to learn more about it and what, what things work and what things don't. I mean, I would recommend you, you got to look at this as like we're going to invest in this and commit to this for a year before we can really start seeing you know, significant, consistent gains yeah. through it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Andrew, back to you. Rapid fire. You've got two more takeaways. How okay. about you just lob them both at us? Yeah. I mean, because, we'll just, I mean, we'll just you started, we down. should finish. That's right. That's true. Well, I'll tell you what. My takeaway number three was the quality of your website is secondary to that of your team, which, of course, you guys you guys stole for yeah. your number one point, given I emailed them to you earlier. So <laughs> we'll just, I mean, you made it probably better than I could have, so we'll leave it there. So I'll jump to my number four which uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, pivot a little bit on it, given uh, that obviously I underestimated my competition here and need to get a little, little more advanced. So <laughs> I think one thing we're going to see with, with businesses growing in the future is in the past, it's been really easy to, uh, I guess, it's a three-level three approach. One, Google has been, Google was brilliant in the way that they set up their business to extract all of the value from the, the advertising delivery agent. Like using an auction to be able to do that was brilliant because PPC is obviously getting really expensive, traditional marketing channels are getting really expensive. And I think in the past you've been able to see people obviously build businesses off of those channels, SEO, PPC, those things. Because they're getting so much more expensive and crowded uh, and the profit margins are coming down, I think we're going to see, you've heard the term growth hacking of course, I think we're going to see a lot more businesses as opposed to, to really building their early momentum with those channels. They're going to build their momentum with branding, with, with uh, crowdsourcing, with organic talking, and then be able to really grow those maybe with paid, but mostly on the backs of email, which is something that they control. And even more than that, kind of uh, new platform arbitrage, going to things, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Pinterest, things like that, where you have cheaper clicks. Facebook is getting out of that area. It's getting expensive. Being able to really grow their brands and leverage that, that those cheaper platforms aren't as utilized and seeing that kind of approach to growing an e-commerce business versus the traditional approach of, hey, start a business, buy some PPC ads, and just kind of wait around. I think that's going to be a trend. Really quick additional point there because I think this is so, so, so important for especially the small businesses trying to gain more traction and acquire new customers. If you are going to go to the bread and butter fundamental advertising media that have been around for a long time, you're going to get smacked hard. It's going to be really hard. It takes a long time to figure it out and gain traction, and you may not even have the budget to make it work. What what Andrew's saying is so critical. It's the it's the new things. As these new things get started, that's when they're they're cheapest. And they may not work. They may be terrible, but that's when they're lowest cost. So there's more risk involved, but there's also more potential upside and and and, and, and rewards there. But as things develop, any industry, any new meet, uh, advertising medium develop, it gets more expensive as, it, as if it's working. It gets more expensive, and, and it gets harder to compete in that. So, uh, like Google product listing ads uh, were really, uh, you know, been really low cost. They're still actually pretty competitive. They're still at this pretty point, competitive, but it's getting, competitive. it is getting more costly, getting more, more competitive, getting more expensive. And so, uh, that's something where you got to jump on that kind of thing. Pinterest is right now beta testing its advertising. Twitter is ad, is, is beta testing advertising. These are new media that need that that I, I would recommend taking a look at those as potential opportunities. Um, but even Facebook, if you started in Facebook, everyone thought it was going to be a conversion channel, but for most it wasn't. It was a it was a, a crowd development or or a a, a, um, a community development tool at, more than it was a conversion tool unless you had the right kind of product. Um, but a lot of people spent a lot of money on Facebook and found out, oh I'm not making it's any sales really hard on to make this. sales. Yeah and I think one of the one of the keys, this goes back to a point we made earlier, but you have to shift from the goal being making a sale to the goal being generating a customer. So now I'm I'm generating a customer that I can have a hopefully a long relationship with and sell to multiple times. And so then, and a quote I heard several years ago that's just brilliant. I think whoever can spend the most to acquire a new customer wins, right? So whoever has their system down mm -hmm. and they are able to invest more to get a customer. They're usually going to win on the marketing that, side. That was of me that said that. I don't think so. No, it was. <laughs> said, if your cost per acquisition low enough, then you can win because you can invest more. I know exactly who I heard. From. Who said it? I heard from Ryan Dice. Psh, who's Ryan Dice? I don't even know who that <laughs> is, and he sounds stupid. <laughs> Goodness, I really said good. it. Okay, you said, I was the you said first too. one to say it. I don't think so. Anyway, but but it's okay, Kurt. You you you're a smart chicken. Right. And so, <laughs> then that's shifting to developing a customer. Building that relationship, it's super, super important. All right. I, I feel like I feel like you all, yeah, you almost granted me a point there. Okay, I'm well, it might be there was there was no needles or, or death threats Wait, or anything flying awesome. across the monitor. No, it was a critical point. Hey, Brett, if it's good, you can't argue with it. It's okay. good. No, it, it is good. A, it's a good point. I mean, I did one up it. I did add a lot of value there. That, <laughs> I think that's yeah. worth 
You really brought it home. I brought it home. You really, yeah, yeah, I mean, you I, really I, did. And I, I disagree with you, Kurt. If it, if it is good, you can still argue with it. You had some great points that I was like, I got to say, I can't, I can't just grant it to them. You know, <laughs> okay. I got I to gotta say something. <laughs> okay, final point on our side is that it's critical to humanize the e-commerce experience. That you, you aren't just, uh, it's not a cold, sterile That's thing. It's robotic. not a cold, sterile medium. That's what that's what brick and mortar has on e-commerce is that it's so human, it's so it's so high touch, it's so tactile. Uh, there, there, we have to find ways to humanize the uh, the online experience, and one of those is actually going back to our old points. So and now I'm going to feel like I'm regurgitating, which is now Andrew's going to jump all over that. And I'm going to look stupid again. <laughs> again. Uh, but uh, but part of that is just creating that great high touch customer exper- customer service experience. If you can afford to do that, if it makes sense for you to do that. Um, but also, like uh, Windsor Circle had some really great points just through email, yeah. um, and, and it's a more automated way of doing it, but you segment out your group to where you've got those that are your best customers, those customers that are buying from you consistently. Make First them feel like customers, the hero. best customers, yeah. how are you treating them uniquely, yeah. giving them a message, giving them an offer. Yep. Using, te- te- using technology are. to create more personalized messaging, yeah. using technology to create more personalized user experience. I, I mentioned this multiple times, as Jeff Bezos said a long time ago, he has 24 million customers, so Love obviously it was a long time ago. No, wait a minute. No, I said this first. Not Jeff Bezos. I said it. <laughs> 24 million customers. I should have 24 million websites. It was personalized. It's like I want to be reactive to that. And, and it works on me. I go to Amazon. I end up buying things I didn't think I would because I'm like, oh, Amazon knows me. They're offering yeah. things to me that make sense to me. And that's the, just the beginning of that technology curve because it continues to get more sophisticated and personalizing experiences in the user experience. So that we really can't say anything more about that because we are we're sucking so much we more time, time than we deserve. Yes. But here's what I suggest we do, Andrew. Here's my offer to you. Proposition. And if you fight this, I just want you to know I will rain terror down on you. <laughs> and we He's will not, not kidding. be friends. He's not kidding. I offer so a draw. Nobody gets the trophy. I put it back on my shelf. We walk away and we, we say. I think we need to have we round reconvene. Two at some point. Yeah, okay. We reconvene. Okay. We 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 circle you know circle our wagons on our own camps and we come back together and uh, and, and and we'll see we'll see about it next time because I feel like it was pretty even and that's that's saying something because we I could normally... open it up to a vote as well. We could let our listeners weigh in just a little bit just to get some some crowd information. That's a deal, Andrew. You want to do that? Let's have a yeah. vote. Let's let's vote this up. I'm up for that. I'm confident in my ability to win on a vote. Okay, then I just want to make one final point. You have I, so many more fans. I disagree with everything I just <laughs> no, I said. I don't think that Andrew and I were equal. I think that we delivered way more value, and I just want to make that clear. <laughs> so you're saying that people should trust you now, but you lied earlier? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. No, hey, actually, this was awesome, this Andrew. Was Thanks for being a guest. We've got to do this again. And uh, I think we've already been talking about some different topics we can we can hit on. Yeah, it was so much history and content with our two shows. I mean, there's there's a lot of opportunity I think for for coming together and uh, delivering more value to the market. So llamacommerceshow.com, check it out. Ecommercefuel.com, check it out as well. Andrew, parting words. You guys were blasted to, to debate with worthy opponents, and it's uh, it was awesome coming on. Thanks for having me. Very good. Awesome. And everyone, you can contact us. Let us know what questions you have about the about uh, your own e-commerce business, challenges you're facing. Uh, seed us content, and if you do, we will send you super cool llama swag. Also, vote and vote for Kurt and I. Really? Yeah, I Seriously. mean, really, in the end. Okay, we're we're going now. Okay, All bye. Right. Stay classy.